Bonsoir, bon après-midi. Euh, je crois que je vais parler en anglais, mais je vais commencer en, en français parce que je suis à Marseille depuis 15 ans. J'ai habité à San Francisco pendant 15 ans avant. Et c'est vraiment drôle, je ne suis pas la même personne quand je parle en français et en anglais. Et euh, c'est difficile à expliquer à mes collègues américains. Marseille, c'est une ville qui a au moins 3000 ans qu'on connaît bien. <rire> Elle a vu des civilisations venir et partir. Il y a eu des crises. Euh, et à San Francisco, on n'a pas la même vision du monde. Et en écoutant les discussions sur les deux jours, euh, il y a des choses qui, pour moi, ne sonnent pas très bien. Euh, et donc, je vais un peu réagir euh, à, à ce que j'ai entendu. So I'm, I'm going to switch to English, and I'm not going to translate what I said in French. Um, I'm totally bilingual. I actually dream in French at the moment, so I must be French dominant. Um, and I want to just give you a few reactions to what I've been hearing, which come from three parts of my professional life. As was mentioned, my scientific career has been in astronomy. I'm currently the director of the observatory here, so I'm more in a, in a management position. For 30 years now, I've edited the Leonardo publications at MIT Press, the book series, and, and two journals. Um, and more recently, I've been heavily involved in trying to set up what I would call safe places uh, for risk takers. And I'm going to talk at the end about an experiment we have going here in Marseille called IMERA, the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Study. Um, I'm a scientist. I think science and technology have done amazingly good things for the world, but science and technology are in deep trouble. Over the last 300 years, we know that we've built a civilization that's unsustainable, and that tells us that neither science or technology in their institutional methods have any moral compass. And so I'm going to play the devil's advocate for you this afternoon and tell you why science and technology urgently need the help of the arts and the humanities. We've talked a lot over the last two days uh, about social contexts, and here I want to focus more on what I would call cultural contexts, uh, and we can maybe talk about the differences. So I guess the first comment I'd make is beware of technophilia. As I said, I lived in San Francisco for 15 years. I love that stuff. But indeed, it leads you to a kind of worldview that occasionally drives you right into the wall. And I think we heard a little bit about antique technologies, where indeed there are things you can do when the wind blows and the sun shines. If, it was, if there was no air conditioning uh, in uh, Marseille, we would have a slightly different uh, lifestyle. And sustainability really is a long-term issue, which is why I, I would tend to use the word culture uh, as a key indicator. Um, I've just, with my wife, uh, seen three of our children leave our home uh, as teenagers finishing high school and now in university. And there are some things which were transmitted slowly from parents to children. And it doesn't matter how much they click online, two of them are back here for the summer, and we're doing things that we learn to do together over 15 or 20 years of living together. And so sustainability is not something that happens quickly. It's generational, uh, and it needs to be nurtured. And so for me, Lift 2011 this year has foregrounded how cultural appropriation and transformation are key enabling factors for so many of the issues that we're talking about. I've just talked about time constants. It takes nine months to gestate a baby. Three mothers can't do it in three months. There are certain things that really take uh, human time. And so the time constants for what we're talking about, we really need to understand deeply. Secondly, we can do a lot of feel-good, homeopathic social innovation, and then look at the global CO2 budget and realize it's just homeopathic. There's been no systemic change. And so indeed, I think we need to be very aware that scalability is not a technical issue or a platform compatibility or an interoperability issue. It's very much 
an issue of human preferences, uses, habits, and that's very, very difficult. I've just shown a, an illustration here of one of the projects that we did in uh, Letterkenny in, uh, in Ireland. We just mentioned Letterkenny in, in a different context, uh, which is the Soft Day group. They work with oceanographic data on the dead zones off the coast of Ireland um, to create with the fishing community there uh, and the local community musical performances that made sensible uh, the fact that the ocean just off the coast there is dead, nothing's growing, both because there's agricultural uh, runoff, but also there's been dredging in the port and there are heavy metals uh, in the ocean and so on. And so this was really a social community project using scientific data to make it sensible. It's often thought that science and technology are driven by business and government. Bullshit. The way that science and technology go is driven by the cultural imagination that six-year-olds develop. Right now, I have an intern living in our house who just wants to do computer games. He grew up where that's where he got value in the life and his cultural imaginary is so embedded in gaming that let me tell you, he's gonna drive the direction that science and technology take in the future. When we heard Jonathan Kunholm uh, earlier about open prosthetics, full of references to the science fiction literature. Our cultural imaginary is full of these ideas of what's desirable. And indeed, yes, business and government have a lot to do in it, but it's the six-year-olds that develop the drive of what they want to do when they grow up. I like to comment that in science and technology, we always talk about curiosity as this childlike, wonderful thing that's going to drive us to a better world. Just want to remind you that St. Augustine, who came from North Africa to this part of the world, for him, curiosity was a sin. Curiosity was the thing that drew you away from your moral compass. Today, curiosity is seen as a modern virtue. Sundar Sarukai in India has written a lot about this, about how there are different drivers for doing things. Curiosity is one of them, but doubt is an equally powerful driver for driving uh, progress. And finally, I just want to reemphasize that from my point of view, I've, I went to the workshop for a while on the the future of innovation and the European Union Ministry of Innovation. What a terrible idea. Innovation is situated. Innovation is embodied, enacted, social, collective. I've traveled like you all to many strange places and you find some of the most amazing things going, in, going on in the strangest places. And so I'm very suspicious about global attempts to develop innovation strategies. I think it's not just a local issue in, in, a, in a geographic sense, but deeply in, in a cultural city. And so as we look at innovation futures, the whole issue of hybrids and smart cities and how we couple the virtual to the real, I guess my plea is really to remember that innovation is situated. And so I guess I put this topic under the area of the ethics of curiosity. That's what Sundar Surukai has been writing about, to try and unpack what it is that the scientific enterprise has within it as all those unstated assumptions about what's good and bad, what should be done and shouldn't be done. As I was listening to the talks of the last couple days, a lot of what I heard I found very reassuring I think it's very true um, that modern science doesn't make common sense. So much of what we know doesn't come through our senses. What's going on in this room? If we could see the hi-fi, the Wi-Fi networks here, as well as we can see light, we would be in a really crowded room right now. Our senses are really filters of the world, not windows on the world, and I think this whole urge to create devices that somehow make visible things that our senses can't see, CO2 doesn't smell. Unfortunately, we're generating so much CO2 that the sea level is rising here in Marseille and we're gonna to have to move off the Vieux Port. So indeed, um, 
I think part of the interest of the, a lot of the technologies that we see that couple the virtual to the real is really to understand the invisible dynamics in a place. Listening to the care session, so much of what we're go is going on in our body is not accessible to our senses. We now have technologies that allow you to know what your internal mechanisms are, and that can be very empowering. Another thing I heard, um, and I think it was Toby Kerridge that really rubbed it in for me, was that one reason that science and technology need the help of arts and humanities is that the scientific revolution has failed and the Enlightenment have failed. We just went through a century of world wars. We're still in a century of famines. So indeed, the whole issue of how you create a socially robust science and technology is a very difficult issue and very critical issue. Uh, Helga Novotny, who's the president of the European Research Council, has been talking about this. And there's a lot of discussion about public engagement. Um, and indeed, how you embed science and technology. And we just heard a number of the talks about how crowdsourcing can be one such mechanism. The problem I have the, with the word public engagement is that it kind of gives the impression that the problem is with the public. And so I would really like to talk about science and technology engagement, because I think the problem is actually in science and technology, not in the public. Another uh, recurring topic uh, over the last three days is really how our network systems is changing the way we work. Number of sessions on, on work and organization. A couple of things I would highlight is the whole issue of how we learn. Um, there's a report from the MacArthur Foundation that came out about a year and a half ago called The Learning Institutions in the Digital Age. I work in a university here that's 300 years old. Montpellier is older. It is really difficult to change 300-year-old institutions. It's much easier to create new institutions that are adapted to the local situation. And so indeed, how in the new age we create a couple system that has both the traditional learning institutions, schools, and universities. But in fact, as that, that report pointed out, if you look at how people get expert information today, the minority of it comes from schools and universities. Most of the expert information that people get access to comes through other mechanisms, really accentuated by the social networks. And so I think this is a really interesting uh, topic area we're clearly going into uh, a system, and a couple of speakers refer to this, which is both top-down and bottom-up, both horizontal and vertical. Um, and we're only just beginning to learn the ontologies, the words that, that we need to describe these things. Uh, Jeff Mulgan talked about open-closed. I like to talk about thick borders. Um, and in fact, uh, in the 1980s, and, uh, there was a lot of discussion of temporary autonomous zones of creating temp temporary structures that then dissolve. Uh, I used to write about electronic monasteries uh, in, in the early 1990s. And there the idea was that you had a switch where you could modulate how your interface was to the outside world. So you could close it, or you could open it, and there'd be a switch that al allowed you to, to modulate. And part of the reason there is new ideas are very fragile. And if you expose them too quickly, to the competing ideas of the marketplace, a lot of good ideas die prematurely. And so the idea behind this was really to look at network culture in a, in a dynamic sense, where in fact there are no borders in a, in a, in a classic sense, but where you can actually modulate uh, the flow uh, through those networks. And I guess one of the things that I've become excited about over the last three or four years is, uh, and I'll give you the hint, there's an emerging science of networks that's moving very fast. It involves mathematicians, topologists. The way that a network is connected together, mathematically and scientifically, you can actually tell what behaviors are enabled or disabled by the very way the structure is network, the network is put together. Now, we kind of know that. We know how important protocols are in determining what can be done and what can't be done in a network system. But I think there's now a lot of useful scientific information and study coming out 
that can give us actually some tools for how to design networks that have particular kinds of behaviors. As was mentioned by Danielle, um, one of the things I'm heavily involved in is uh, the Leonardo organization, which, uh, which has two nonprofits, one in San Francisco and one in Paris. We've been going for now since 1967, uh, promoting and documenting the, uh, the work of artists involved in science and technology. And here I just want to sort of feature one of the things that we have really championed, which is viewing artist and designer-driven research. Now that's become a popular topic recently, but let me tell you, research in science and technology are driven by all kinds of motivations. We, in the 1960s and 70s, started working with the first computer artists, let me tell you, in 1968, it was not at all clear that we're going to be digital culture industries today of the size they were. And so these artists uh, were not only technical innovators, but early adopters. Many of them proved to be wrong, but many of them then went into the new uh, industries that we, that we have today. And so I think we need to take seriously that this coupling of culture and science and technology that the artist is actually a source of new ways of thinking, new ways of researching, new discoveries. With different objectives, it's true, different success uh, metrics, uh, but I think we need more places uh, in our society where this coupling can be done uh, quickly and, and uh, interestingly. We've had a lot of discussion um, over the last three days about open data. I'm an astronomer. In the 1980s and 90s, uh, I was very involved with NASA uh, on developing open, what are called <laughs> virtual observatories in astronomy, making public data available uh, from the astronomical world. And so basically, I think there are two sides to this. If your tax euro paid to take the data, you have a right to it. And secondly, you need to contribute data to the common pool, and we've talked about a lot about we had the crowd mapping uh, ex ex example re uh, just before. Open observatories I'm very excited about. There is a proliferation of what are called citizen science projects. And let me tell you, a little bit of data is power. In Japan right now, amateurs are going, taking data on radioactivity levels and really challenging the official uh, numbers on what areas uh, in Japan are safe to live in right now. And that data is really gives you the ability to negotiate. There's a lot of community remote sensing going on, which as a scientist I'm very interested in, and we've heard a number of examples over the last uh, two days. Sorry, that's my two-minute warning. Um, Adam Greenfield uh, yesterday talked about public objects. I think that's a really uh, interesting and, and useful concept that needs to be unpacked. Um, recently, I was on the jury for the Buckminster Fuller Challenge Award. There were many projects in there that I would call participatory uh, science projects of various kinds. Basically, if you need to survive, what data do you need and how do you get it yourself? One of the projects that we recognized was the Congo Participatory Mapping Project, which basically works with local communities in the Congo so that they have better maps than the multinational companies. And it's a very powerful project, really using very simple, uh, low-level uh, mapping, local mapping technologies. Finally, am I out of time? Two minutes. Well, yeah, I have been watching the clock. Okay, I'll just finish quickly. As I said uh, in my opening, um, we have an experiment going here in Marseille called the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Study. Basically, the idea is to create a safe place where artists who want to work with scientists can work together or scientists who want to work with artists. Um, we had uh, artists in residence at our local climate change observatory in Haute Provence, and he set up in the observatory his own sensors, infrared sensors and motion detectors, studying the same objects that the climate change scientists were studying. We had an artist come in whose project is Cy Cinema for Primates, Rachel Meyery. Basically, she makes artworks and games for monkeys, not for humans. And it turns out that's an amazing source of innovation. And finally, right now, Jim Jimjewski, who's a nanoscientist, is here. 
He's been working on what's called physical intelligence. He calls it interfacial intelligence. And his question is just really simple. As you add atoms together on a pile, at what point do they start doing things that we would call intelligent? And he's working with a local fireworks artist, Pierre-Alain Hubert. They've made nano fireworks, the smallest fireworks ever built. But they're also working on exploding molecules, a really unexpected collaboration. So I'm going to close. So I guess my comment is, yes, be radical, but be doubtful, be humble, be patient, and be. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Roger. On ne va pas avoir de, de temps vraiment pour des questions, mais je crois que les questions, tu les as posées. Okay. Euh, et on, avait, on a vraiment besoin euh, à chaque fois euh, à Lyft d'un regard euh, qui sait être critique. Et c'est important qu'on qu le soit. Je pense que ça, on va le garder. On va peut-être euh, réfléchir à ça. Ça ne peut pas être une devise. Pour nous.